y'all. So thank y'all so much for being here today. Welcome to our goodness. Is this the fourth office hours that we've done this year already? I think so. We've really been cramming them in and getting lots of great questions from y'all. So, you know, encouraging you to continue to um, pop in your questions into into the question database and attach pictures when you can and share this with your friends because this office hours is open to everybody right we want to encourage our master gardener gardener volunteers to um, submit questions and to be on so that they can learn and know the types of things questions that are coming into our county offices also we want, you know, encourage agents to hop on with us when they can and just kind of get a heads up on things that they may be seeing starting uh, questions starting to come into the county offices. So invite your friends. This is an open session. We want everybody to be involved and glad to glad to see you here today. So you may notice that our question panel is a bit reduced from what we normally have. We generally have about 10 or 12 folks on here with us today, but it's summertime and we've got stuff going on everywhere. So, um, but we do have a, a good group of folks here with us today to answer questions. So it might be a little more laid back. It might take me a few more minutes to find pictures as we're going through things because we don't have quite as many people to fill the spaces, but we're gonna have a great time and answer lots of questions. Also, I wanna encourage you, if you have some uh, spur of the moment questions, Put them in the chat box. Natalie has activated that. And if we have time, we're going to try to mix in as many of those as we can. So just off the cuff questions, um, put them in there. OK, are we ready? I have to smile at any meeting that has Greg and Celeste on it. Anybody ever wondering if we're going to have enough words to fill the <laughs> it, it takes me back to our very first COVID Zoom when we're like, well, the two of them can probably fill up the hour. And after 47 minutes of Celeste showing us weeds <laughs> crawling around her yard, Greg was like, is she going to let me talk? Like, I, um, I, I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Y'all won't let us live that one down. It's, <laughs> it's going to be around for a while. Good deal. Okay. Well, we're going to cha change it up a little bit. This week, we're going to start with uh, fruit and veggie type questions. So I'm going to let Natalie and Seth kind of just lead us on that. And as they're going through things, I'll try to find the pictures that go with the questions y'all are addressing. Does that sound good? Yeah. Oh, and remember to introduce yourself again. Uh, we started doing that last week for those if we have new people. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Celeste Scott and I'm the horticulture extension agent in Madison County. And I'm also a member of our, our horticulture uh, team here. So, OK. All right. That's awesome. So I think let's start with the fruit and vegetable category. And um, Seth, what do you think? What should we talk yeah. about first? Yeah. So let's start with some early season pests because, you know, we're kind of transitioning from the early season pests more towards the full on summer pests that we might be uh, starting to see. So when I think of early season pests, I start to automatically think of thrips, aphids, some of those more soft bodied insects, and then some of those that might cause some of those uh, tiny little window panes and damages like flea beetles, right? And Celeste already messed up. I'm Seth Whitehouse, <laughs> uh, extension agent in Anderson County. Um, and I'm also the master gardener for the uh, Anderson County uh, Master Gardener Association as well. So, um, yep, that's the one. So let's thank you for pulling that up. So if y'all can see on this picture here, um, all those tiny uh, little feeding damage uh, is from a chewing mouth part of a beetle insect. And there's tons of different flea beetles that are associated and they're not fleas, they, but they do jump like fleas, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and so generally speaking, um, these are our early season pests. Uh, where most damage is shown in early spring uh, to late spring period um, and usually affect the newly emerged seedlings that we might have in there. So um, for, you know, a commercial setting or a larger community garden setting, you know, we can always think about using yellow sticky traps to monitor for these. They have a beautiful iridescent color on them. Um, and if you try to get closer on them, they're going to jump away like fleas. Um, and so you can always look at that picture there too on their feeding damage. And oftentimes we won't see the adults. We'll just see the damage that they've caused uh, like this picture here. Uh, so they did a great job. Uh, they said, I believe I have potato flea beetles. How can I manage this pest? Great question. Um, and so generally speaking for the commercial setting, that threshold of when we need to apply an insecticide application here would be about 15 shot holes per leaflet. Um, and so you can see here, we're, we're probably a little bit over that. 
but also consider, um, you know, this isn't a commercial setting. This is probably uh, a home garden, and maybe that might not be necessary. Um, but if an insecticide application is being used, we can always um, look at what is labeled for potatoes. And the product Carbaryl 7 uh, is one of those that is labeled for use. There's a few others as well um, that can uh, be found on that You Can Control Garden Insects publication that I can drop in a link here in a minute. Um, but back to the main question, how can I manage this, uh, this pest here um, most effectively? And I would probably not recommend that as we're kind of gearing up into June. Um, where spring and summer periods coming in here, the crops have reached over a four or five leaf stage uh, and can probably withstand plenty of that damage without starting to see uh, any issues long term. Um, and that population of the flea beetles is most likely declining at this point where the temperatures are getting a little bit too high for them. Um, so I would recommend maybe cultural controls and maybe not spraying um, as we wouldn't have very good effective control at this point. But, you know, they... They move into our gardens by feeding on other weeds uh, before these potato leaflets have even come out or emerged. Um, so maybe removing some of our weeds, um, you know, that could be a source for more flea beetles. Uh, removing old crop debris, uh, making sure we're composting that correctly. Um, and some people have even noted uh, success with a trap crop. And what that theory is, is that we have a crop put out that will emerge earlier than all the other preferred crops. Um, like a like a radish uh, leafy crop that comes up and that uh, flea beetle will start to feed on the radish uh, tops there and you can actually uh, manage those flea beetles then before they start uh, feeding on your preferred crop. So uh, great question there. Hopefully I kind of uh, hit that one pretty well. Hey, yeah. Seth, uh, yeah. if I could ask you too, a lot of times homeowners, and I'm glad you talked a lot about managing those through cultural practices because a lot of our homeowners probably don't want to use as many pesticides. And if they do, a lot of times they use, want to use an organic pesticide. Yep. So what are options for those bigger type beetles and things like that? Or are there options of organic pesticides for controlling those? Yeah, that's a great question. And the product I mentioned there, Carbaryl 7 is not an organic uh, product. And you can always see uh, organic products are labeled uh, through OMRI, uh, that's the acronym that they use, Organic Materials Review Institute, um, and the only one that can do well for those beetle hard-shelled uh, insects is a product called Spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, Spinosad. Uh, there's a few trade names there on that one, and that one does a pretty good job as an organic labeled insecticide that can control some of these beetles. Just make sure you read the label, that it's labeled for, you know, potatoes in this instance, but for your other crops as well. Um, but when we think of other organic insecticides like a neem oil, uh, um, horticultural oil, um, you know, anything along those lines that might be an insecticidal soap, um, those do great on those early season pests that are soft body. So the thrips, the aphids, uh, you know, so forth. But when we start to talk about beetles and Japanese beetles and, and these hard shelled uh, insects that might not be a caterpillar or a soft shelled insect, um, they're just not going to have very good control. So that's why the cultural control methods are very important to consider here before we start making those decisions. So yeah, great, great point there, Greg. Yeah, I think that's it's really good to talk about the hard and the soft body. And there are even some other, um, you know, when we think about, say, like a Mexican bean beetle or something, we may be able to have efficacy at an immature stage where we lose it once the pest gets larger. Uh, squash bugs are another example. And so the difference between those softer products and the more traditional. Oh, I also want to throw in one note about seven. So um, it is traditionally carbaryl as the active ingredient, Ooh, yes. but the trade name seven has actually been <laughs> sold. And so you will actually sometimes see seven under Garden Tech is the um, company that, that I know of that is actually pyrethroid products. So at Zeta Cypermethrin, you will actually have other active ingredients that are now sold and marketed under the seven trade name. Now, these are, of course, you know, widely labeled for a range of residential crops, but just make sure that you look at the label, you know, because some of those things may have changed. That's exactly right. I should have mentioned that too. Thanks for bringing that up, Natalie. And Natalie did bring up a great point there too, is 
you know, a lot of times when we see the pest, it may have already caused its damage. So it's really important to do some, you know, background check on that insect to see when the most susceptible time is to control it. And the first example I think of that is the Japanese beetle. We see them out there, they're doing their thing, but that might not be the best time to control them when they're adults and we can try to hit them when they're uh, larva uh, going into the soil in that August, September period and using an organic uh, granular insecticide to control them would be much more effective than, you know, trying to eat them in revenge sprays. The term Greg's got me on these days. So uh, it's, it'll make you feel good, but uh, it doesn't do as much damage for, for controlling our pests. So yeah, great point there. Uh, while we're talking about beetles, Celeste, there is actually a cucumber beetle question and picture that came in, and well, then we'll let Greg jump in. Okay, okay, let me look for it. So one thing that I wanted to say, even along those pesticides, and he's talking about the label, uh, I had a homeowner contact me here the other day and said, you know, I was told that I could use uh, chlorothalonil to uh, control this particular disease in this crop. And I need, uh, I can't find on the label what the, the rate is for use. And the question I ask, is it on the label for that pesticide that you've gotten? And it wasn't. And actually that pesticide wasn't labeled for use in that crop. And while it was a very common, it was chlorothalonil, a very common fungicide that we use in lots and lots and lots of things, it was not labeled for that product. Now, was the reason it's not labeled for that product because it's a dangerous pesticide? No, in this particular case, in that crop, and in this case, it was apples, uh, you probably run into situations where the uh, fungicide itself can actually have some adverse effects on that particular crop. So read the label, follow the label labels of law, application rates for whatever those are uh, for F, you know, the best efficacy. And if it tells you to use them at this time frame, that's when you need to use it that time frame. And so there's a lot of great information that Seth talked about there in terms of the timing of those pests, uh, organic sprays. And again, every really good uh, management, pest management program, whether it's insects, fungal disease, weeds, begins with a really good plan and, and good timing of uh, application of those pesticides uh, to where they are most effective and not just those revenge sprays that make you feel good and have no control whatsoever on the pest problem you're dealing with. Uh, so, so while we're talking about leaf feeding beetles, this is, this is just a, I don't know any way to describe it other than sad, right? So, um, this is what we would see with a fairly heavy early season cucumber beetle feeding. And um, how do we know it's cucumber beetle feeding? Well, there happens to be one right there um, in that. So that looks like a striped set. I mean, a, yeah, a striped. Um, so striped and spotted, we have uh, two different closely related cucumber beetles that can do this feeding damage. And there is actually a secondary compound that is produced by young cucurbit plants, cucurbitacin, that attracts uh, these um, insects. So uh, while there will be feeding when the plants get larger, it is the most severe when they are very young like this. In fact, um, for those of you who know, I grow trials in Knoxville at our research station. The cucumber beetle population is so heavy at the farm that the past three years, I have just gone to transplants because it was so hard to keep down the feeding damage at um at this young young stage so um now you know we all make our own personal choices about materials right so you know you all but i will say that in my trials at this stage for this pest that is one time when i will use uh you know pyrethroid type of product because i'm there's no bloom i'm not you know you know risking any pollinators and the damage is just so devastating because they can spread bacterial wilt with their feeding damage. Yep, and I will note that resource that we dropped down, uh, Natalie, on the Youth Control Garden Insects talks about both the spotted and the striped. Um, and one of the things that they talk about cultural controls, if you really don't want to spray, uh, is you know protecting those young plants with a cone-shaped uh, barrier. And just think about that barrier control, right? If they don't have access to get on those seedlings with some sort of cone-shaped 
I know it might look a little funky, but uh, it will protect them at least until runners are, 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 are starting to develop and that plant can start to fight off some of that um, insect feeding too. So something to think about there. Yeah. And a screen, like that's a very good oh, point. Yeah. If we're talking yeah. about a fairly small scale, if your cucumbers and things like that are in a raised bed or someplace that's not hugely expansive, you could put a screen or a row cover. It could help you with squash vine borer. It could help you with like a lot of those early pests. Now, once you get to bloom and pollination, it would have to come off, but you would get those plants much larger and pass some of those early early season challenges. Absolutely. And, and in the chat, someone asked, can these two insects affect Brussels sprouts planted as well? Not to my knowledge, I've not seen them. Usually Brussels sprouts, we, we're talking about aphids or cabbage worms are the two most common uh, insects that are feeding on those uh, Brussels sprouts. Not to say, I, uh, maybe there could be some feeding there. I'm not sure. One thing I want to throw in there too, homeowners, if, if you're not wanting to use pesticides or at the least very limited use of pesticide, look at those plant cultivars. You know, start with a really good site and where you're planting, but then look at what those cultivars are because a lot of these diseases, there may not be an option. And Natalie, you might want to, Diane's got a question about growing sweet potatoes and spots on the leaves. Some of the diseases that we may have in these plants, there may not be a product that's actually labeled for it. Or it could be a viral disease like a, a tomato spotted wilt virus that you're not gonna treat it with anything except good cultural practices and good cultivar selection as to what you're wanting to use. And so look at those seeds. And I know a lot of times we hear so much about heirloom seeds, but man, we've spent a lot of years in developing and researching and growing uh, plants that are still very exceptional in terms of the quality of that vegetable or that fruit that we're dealing with um, and, and taste good as well. So don't just be hung exclusively. Well, the heirloom's the only one. And I know like uh, uh, my master gardener, Fred Mullen, all the time talks about uh, Cherokee purple and being a great tomato. But he said, you know, you've got to be content that you're going to spend a lot of time growing a tomato and not get many tomatoes. And yeah, it's going to taste great. Uh, but a lot of uh, work and effort just into keeping that plant alive and growing those tomatoes. So think about those cultivars that you're picking. When uh, Greg brought up tomatoes, we actually had a great photo that came in that shows tomato spotted wilt virus or what definitely appears to be <laughs> tomato spotted wilt virus in um, in the garden. And so this is something that I tend to see as an earlier season, not that it can't be impactful later in the season, but um, this is spread by thrips feeding. So a really small uh, leaf and flower feeding insect. And oftentimes transmission will occur in the greenhouse. And so you may have young plants in the field that are showing this odd and uh, part of the reason why I really like this picture is you can kind of see the rings. They are almost like a ring with a little target spot on the center. And so these are some of the indicators that we may have a viral issue when we start to see kind of that mosaic pattern. Now, it doesn't always look like this. Sometimes I have seen, you know, more extensive leaf damage that almost looks like it's been scorched. But this is a highly characteristic version of that. And a lot of times, so people may see those brown spots and the first thing they think, oh, that's a fungal disease. Not necessarily. So there's a lot of keys that you kind of have to go through. Now, if we had the tomato fruit out here and we look and see all those concentric rings and that mosaic pattern on the fruit, we know without a doubt uh, that we're dealing with a virus. And that same could be said with our ornamental plants. When we start seeing those mosaic patterns throughout those plants, a lot of times uh, uh, it's very indicative of uh, viruses within that plant. Yeah, that's a good point that um, TSWV will show up on the fruit if the, if the plant is larger and at a bearing stage. Um, my preference would be to catch it before we get to the point that it is impacting the fruit. Because while Western flower thrips population may be higher in the greenhouse. They do exist in our gardens. And so there can be transmission that takes place in the field. So when 
I would, if I saw that plant uh, in, you know, in the garden, I would say, um, you know, chances are like, you know, if you want to know for sure, we have to test it. Like, you know, I can't visually 100% diagnose a virus, but we would probably go ahead and pull that plant out to reduce the risk of spread before we get to the point where, you know, we're seeing a lot of issues on, on fruit. Fruit's not going to be very good. The plant's going to be stunted. You're honestly not losing that much. So don't be that homeowner that's got that plant that's ADR, ain't doing right, and <laughs> try everything in your power to nurse that plant back to life when you've got this beautiful row of healthy tomatoes reach in there and just pull it out, get rid of the vector that's maybe going to be spreading that disease to other plants rather than trying to nurse it back to life. Um, so just pay attention to those things, scout those uh, very regularly. And that's one of the reasons why we tell people, put those orchards or your uh, vegetable gardens in your backyard where you have to walk through them every day. So you notice these things early and you can get on and get diagnosis and start treatment if a treatment is available for those diseases. Celeste is like, I let these fruit and vegetable people get started and they are still talking. But no, gonna, no. I mean, we, this is good. And we still <laughs> yeah. have at least yeah. two other really good ones yeah. that we need to talk about. So don't feel rushed okay. at all because we've got plenty of time. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, well, we'll we'll do the peach one last. But there was actually a really good question that was about trellis systems that I oh, think okay. might be good um, to mention. So, So we had a question come in that was asking about stakes and trellises and this topic of sanitation. And so the answer is that, yes, some bacterial diseases can be spread by stakes. And so for like the big producer guys, there are recommendations to power wash your stakes and then soak them in a bleach solution. Washing is important because the organic matter can quickly ruin the efficacy of bleach when you do a dip. Um, in many ways, it would actually be able easier to spray a metal or something like that. So, you know, if you have a system of uh, trellises, you can, you know, do some some spray on type of sanitation. Um, on a small scale, my preference would just be have a bonfire and uh, roast some hot dogs and marshmallows burn last year's tomato steaks and uh and buy some uh new ones but um part of the question was also are there specific recommendations for different kinds of trellis systems and different kinds of crops and um and i would say we probably like that would be a fun publication to do maybe kind of a small space urban focus but typically what we say are you know larger more substantive stakes for indeterminate tomatoes versus determinate um, you know, your melons, your cucumbers, a lot of those can take a variety of support systems. You just may need to support the fruit. It's often more about supporting the fruit than it is about supporting the plant. Um, but but yeah, I think that that might be cool for a future pub. Do you guys want to toss in anything else on the trellis? Natalie said supporting that plant. And I remember the first time I ever grew a watermelon and I neglected to support that watermelon on the soil. And Thought I had a great harvest and then flipped it over, ready to get this, cut it off the vine and realize it's completely rotted from the base because it had soil contact on there. So just something to think about too on plant support. And Natalie, there is a great publication that kind of talks about stakes, different cages, trellises, the twine system as well. And that uh, another thing I can drop in there, the plant management practices publication uh, that hits really good on, on a lot of uh, the points Natalie just brought up there. But yep. Awesome. Hey, while we are still in the topic of fruits and vegetables, we had a, a really good question that came in with a great picture talking about uh, what is this feeding on my developing tomato fruits? Do y'all remember that one? Oh, can yeah. Bring, yeah. Can I bring that picture up? Yeah. And yeah. also, I want to challenge everybody. There's something hidden in the picture. So look for it. Maybe you'll find it before Nat Natalie or Seth points it out to you. <laughs> okay. So it's like a where's Waldo type. Yeah. Thing. It's, it's a mystery. Seth's going to be excited when, <clears throat> uh, when he sees it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is a really interesting, uh, picture. Well, actually there's a couple of, of physiological things coming on. So when we see um, fruit damage like this, you know, we might be tempted to think, is this insect 
feeding damage. Now there are caterpillars, right? Uh, tomato, uh, tobacco hornworm, as well as yellow striped um, you know, army worms. Like there are caterpillars and things that will feed on fruit. But in this specific instance, we can see kind of those brown edges. This is actually not insect feeding damage. This is actually a defect in the flower. And so um, we used to see this in the greenhouse in hydroponic systems when their, the bee population was just too high. They just visited and, and messed up those flowers. We don't see that as much in the field. But there are, you know, low temperature events, there are environmental um, stressors, um, and there's a lot of genetic things. Greg already mentioned uh, some of our heirlooms today. Heirlooms tend to have a little bit more issues with the formed flowers. And when that happens, sometimes we will have some of these issues where we're just essentially seeing the locule there. We're kind of seeing to the inside of the fruit. So this is actually a, a flower defect. Cat facing kind of falls in this category. And oftentimes we'll see this as an early season issue. One of the reasons that I thought it would be fun um, to talk a little bit about some of these physiological things is because we have had some cool nights over the last few weeks. And you may have some young plants that had um, fruit, you know, or very early fruit, right? Small flowers. Uh, that were set. So lots of times those physiological issues, whether it be flower defects or cat facing, we'll see early in the season, but they will they will tend to decrease as the um, as the season goes on. All right, Seth, what what uh, what do we got there? Oh, Did okay. you so find it? Oh yeah, if y'all look right beneath that lesion Natalie was talking about, there's like these weird little stalks with an egg-like uh, structure there at the end. And yep, those are lacewing uh, eggs. And once they hatch and the larvae begin to start feeding on some of our pests, they can eat up to 200 aphids per week. So that is more than any insecticide application I can think of, uh, you know, preventing pest population buildup. So, you know, if, if this was me and with my tomato, I'd leave this guy be and let that uh, egg uh, go through its life cycle and uh, help with some beneficial insects. And if you guys wanna promote more lace wings, uh, the best way to do that is just provide more floral resources. Uh, and, and of course, they need to supplement their nutrition, not just feeding on aphids, but also with that pollen and, and nectar resource uh, uh, that gives them their carbohydrates and their protein, right? So uh, something to think about for supporting our beneficials. Hey, was, go ahead. Uh, one thing, you mentioned this several times, cat facing. Talk to us because one of the most common problems and questions that I'm going to have come in the office, all of us ag agents are going to be cat facing, blossom end rot, some of those tomato disorders as we move in. Can you talk about uh, water issues and how those drive that? You touched a little bit on climate and how we can reduce those problems with those physiological um, yeah, so so cat facing is one of those interesting things where, you know, we're still kind of, you know, trying to get at the basis of what the mechanism is of that. We talked a little bit about some of those um, temperature issues, some of the cultivar issues. There are times when really excessive pruning can push that or, you know, really high nitrogen use. So kind of moderation in our practices now, when it comes to blossom end rot, that becomes a physiological issue that we, we may have a little bit more control over because what it really is, is the plant, you know, and environment water movement not being in good balance, right? So um, the, the leaves are rapidly losing water to the atmosphere or they, they should be. And um, if there is kind of a competition between who gets water and nutrients, it's going to be the leaves instead of the fruit. And so if we have a time when there's a lot of water loss to the atmosphere, the plant may shuttle those water and nutrients to the leaves and, and shut off the, the spigot, so to speak, from the fruit. And so if we have, you know, dry conditions, um, low humidity conditions, rapid water loss early in the season, you know, we can see some of that. The flip side is that if we have really cool, humid conditions, then there's not very much water being lost to the environment and there's just not that supply. Why am I talking so much about water? Because calcium 
is moving with that water. Um, so there's no way to get calcium to our fruits and our leaves if we're not rapidly, you know, moving water uh, through that plant. So, um, so how, how can how can we adjust that? Evenness in soil moisture is the best thing that we can do. So reducing those rapid fluctuations and I'll stop talking here and let other people jump in, but it's kind of been a dry spring here. Like I'm glad I had irrigation on early in the season to hopefully stave off some of those challenges. Well, bless your heart for your dry spring over here in West Tennessee. I feel like we just get a rain every couple of days. Every time I turn around, it's wet again. We can't get out there and do what we need to do. No, but we're thankful for those rains that we are are grateful for those, getting those for sure. And um, I'm going to remember that for now. Why am I talking so much about water? Because I feel like we do. It's so important. It is, and yeah. It's associated with like all of the, our plant functions. <laughs> so we need to understand how water moves in the plant so we can that Great explanation by Natalie on how that calcium will move through. And just remember those summer pop-up showers that are hitting randomly, it might seem like a lot of water provided to your garden, but make sure, you know, check that uh, uh, dryness, just depth uh, within that soil, just to make sure it is uh, appropriately watered in that garden. You might need to supplement even further, but yeah, I mean, drip irrigation soaker hoses are going to go a long way this, this, uh, this, this season. So sorry, Taylor, I saw you unmuted there. Oh, no, I was just going to make a similar comment just about irrigation. And even though you think you're getting it, you may not be. So you need to be double checking your soil moisture levels. Mm -hmm.